Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I say your name. You solemnly swear. To support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. What motivated me to join the Army? I, I didn't, I was drafted. Back in that era, uh, you had no choice. Uh, nothing mo motivated me. I was drafted, so I, was, I had to go. Well, most of all, it was, there was a war going on in Vietnam, and uh, I was 18 years old, and uh, I was gonna be a prime candidate to go in the Army, which was against my... <laughs> I did not want to do that, and uh, so I, I chose the Navy. I went and uh, signed up, went in, and uh, took off two weeks later for boot camp over at uh, Great Lakes Naval Training Center. About a year and a half out of high school, you received your notice in the mail. You got a little postcard. It says, you have been selected. And at that time, you can't join any reserve or any other uh, outfit. So uh, then you had like 30 days, I think, you know. I, I came through ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps. So when I graduated from college, I was commissioned as a lieutenant. My father and my uncle, my dad was in the Navy, as was my uncle, who was actually not in the American Navy, but he was in Free French Navy. Uh, they were both World War II vets, and I also wanted money for college and I started with the Florida Army National Guard. Actually, I was a teenager during the tail end of the war, the uh, Second World War, <clears throat> and um, I kind of got into the military kind of thing and decided I might make a career in the military. And during my last year of high school, I began to uh, uh, contact my congressman, see if I could get an appointment to West Point. Actually, I guess I really didn't, it didn't matter which one of the academies I went to. Uh, boot camp was two months long, and I was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma at the artillery base. And um, it was, 24, uh, 24 months of pure, on a job, running. You never walked, you ran anywhere. You got called out two o'clock in the morning for a march, or you got an inspection at four o'clock in the morning. And if the inspection failed, if someone's bed wasn't right, they tip all the beds over. There were 200 guys per barracks. And uh, so inspections were very, they would, they would pull surprise inspections. But it taught you a lot, I think. It, um, you learn very quickly to react very quickly without questioning anything. And that's the goal of boot camp, that you respond without asking or thinking. You just, you just do what you are asked to do. Basic training, which is to uh, walk, uh, get acclimated to the Army, and in their way of things, and, and uh, that lasted only about six weeks. My first assignment was to what was called an indoctrination course, which is, I guess, basic training for professionals. <laughs> it was a lot of cleaning and polishing and marching and sweating and learning the Army way. And I was also in one of the last companies going through basic training with the Women's Army Corps. After that, we all got integrated into the Army itself, so there wasn't a separate corps. Uh, the, the training was for a chemical warfare officer. I was commissioned in the chemical corps. So we went through a range of training, but the most memorable training exercise in August in Alabama was an exercise of decontaminating equipment after it has been uh, uh, contaminated 
with things like nerve agent. Now you talk about nerve gas, it's actually a liquid. So what we were doing was, trying, was uh, rehearsing, practicing how to decontaminate a, a Jeep or a tank that has been doused in this very, very uh, dangerous material. In those days, back in the 1960s, we didn't have the hazmat suits that one sees today. In the 1960s, these suits were made of rubber. And underneath the, 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 uh, uh, the rubber suit, we wore long johns in August in Alabama. And they weren't just long johns, they were uh, dipped in um, paraffin to make them more impervious to this. So we're out there under the summer sun in three or four layers of completely impermeable clothing. It had to be impermeable and gas masks and hoods and double, triple gloves and all that. Every blessed one of us lost about five or 10 pounds that day. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was the kind of thing that we had to practice. Uh, uh, it, it's a blessing that nothing like that was ever really needed. And in fact, very shortly thereafter, President Nixon banned us from even thinking about using that kind of stuff. So uh, I had really good training for something that was never needed. I'm sure glad I did it. At the time, I was very hesitant to go. My parents didn't want me to go. My girlfriend didn't want me to go. Well, she didn't try to really stop me or anything, but she wasn't, uh, she didn't want to see me leave. I went. Glad I did. I had all good experiences. I met some wonderful people. Submariners are a tight organization. Like I ask you, how many submariners do you know? You don't know any. So they're a rare group. And the ones that are, are tight knit. They're very tight knit, they stick together. I got friends I made in the Navy I'll never, I'll never make in civilian life. I met a lot of interesting people. It was, it was really, I was a farm boy in Livonia, Michigan when it was a farmland back in the 40s. And I met people from New Jersey, New York, California, Nebraska. Even met one cowboy. He was a cowboy out in Arizona. <laughs> but you met all types of people. And at that time, they were just starting to integrate the uh, uh, black military people with the whites before the whites would by themselves and the blacks would by themselves. And we were one of the first units. And it, it went well because we all faced the same issues. <laughs> and um, it, it, was, it was interesting. It, it, was a, it, was a, it was a learning experience. My initial thing was I was only going in, my plan had been to go in for a short time. And I found that it kind of fit my perspective on life. I liked the fact that I had a purpose you get to interact with people and you learn about their history, so you got a better perspective. Plus, you get an idea of what the world really is as opposed to reading about it and seeing movies. Uh, yeah, you can read a lot of books, but it doesn't give you the perspective as when you go to a place like I did in Korea, and on Buddha's birthday, which is very important to Koreans and any Buddhists who celebrate um, Buddha's birthday, which is, by the way, the 5th of May. And I went with a group to a Buddhist temple, and it was at night, so we're traveling, we're walking up all these stairs and going into the temple, and it's all lit by lanterns and, and candles and it's just beautiful. You just don't realize what that is like until you experience it for yourself and you can't do that through a camera lens. You really can't. My, my job was, uh, well first of all I went, to, I went from boot camp to submarine school out in New London, Connecticut. And uh, that was about 10 or 12 weeks long. And uh, after that was over, I went out to the fleet. 
Now when aboard a submarine, submarine's got Squadron One, Hawaii, and uh, it was a missile boat squadron. There were eight submarines in the, in the, uh, in that squadron. Four of them had missiles, the rest of them were fast attack submarines. I had two specialties. My primary was a laboratory officer. My secondary was battalion surgeon's assistant. Battalion surgeon assistant basically is the administrative officer for the corpsman and the surgeon that's assigned to a battalion. Now this is interesting now, there's only one group in the whole world like this. It's the United States Army 88th Field Artillery Battery Searchlight. We had the big old searchlights and we worked with the artillery. We'd go up on the mountains at night and light up targets for them. And there was only one outfit in the whole United States of, the, of that. Wow. And, and we also had that 280 atomic cannon in Fort Sill. Really? They, they, they developed that back in the um, 50s and it had a semi cab on the front and a semi cab on the back. It drive, set down and it, it, it would fire like 25 miles. And that round went off, they had a fire over the base from the east range to the west range, and that went off, the barracks kind of shook. <laughs> I was most proud of my last rank uh, when I was promoted to Sergeant First Class, which is the equivalent of a Marine Gunnery Sergeant. I was also a Platoon Sergeant, which is the same thing, it just it signifies that who I was in charge of how many people and at the time that I was promoted there were only a hundred women in the military police corps at that time and I felt kind of special. On July 7th I think it was 1940 45 I, we arrived at the island of Iwo Jima and there, from there we had to go from, the, from that transport ship to a landing craft because there's no, no, uh, no pier. And then of course uh, we, we started into our, our assignment of, uh, of uh, repairing aircraft. That's what I did. And, and the first, first assignment we had was to change it. Uh, engine on, on P-47, yeah. When I got to Japan and into the replacement depot, uh, I got back to my, or I got to my primary uh, service specialty, which was a laboratory officer. So I didn't have to go out to Korea as a battalion surgeon's assistant. And my assignment then was at the, lab at the Far East Command General Laboratory, General Medical Laboratory, for the whole time I was uh, then, the remainder of my time on active duty. If you know anything about missile boats, they spend a lot of time in deep water. Cold water on the Pacific, not so cold on the Atlantic. I was on the Pacific course in Hawaii. Most of our operations were in the North Pacific, up around the Bering Sea, Hawaii, outer Mongolia. It was crummy duty. 90 days out, 180 days in, 90 days out, 180 days in. That got pretty monotonous. As long as you're here, why don't you, why don't you tell me you know, what, what you'd like to do here at Fort Hamilton. I said, well, sir, I would, I'd probably need some more information about what the, what the fort does. Information, great, we'll make you the public information officer. So I edited the, uh, the Post newspaper, wrote speeches for the general um, for uh, uh, six, eight months, and finally I, I called uh, the personnel office in the, in the Pentagon. And I said, well, get me out of here. And he said, Lieutenant, this is your lucky day. 
we have a slot opening up for a Chemical Corps Lieutenant with the 25th Infantry Division. And I said, oh, where are they based? Now here is a life lesson. If you ask the wrong question, you will get the wrong answer. The answer to the question that I asked, where is the 25th Infantry Division based? That answer was Schofield Barracks, Honolulu, Hawaii. Sign me up. Now the question that I should have asked, but didn't, was where are they now? The answer to that question was about 25 miles inside the Cambodian border. So, by the time I joined the 25th Infantry Division, uh, I picked them up right there on the border with uh, Cambodia and Vietnam. There was a lot happening. There was a lot going on. That was a Cold War. If you, you might recall the Cold War, Cold War between the United States and Russia. And it was, uh, it was, don't grab my property and I won't grab yours. But they watched very closely what we did and we watched very closely what they did. I suppose my longest time that I was any one place was at Fort Lewis, Washington but for four years. But after, in that four years I was deployed out either for exercises or school. Uh, so I wasn't actually there totally four years. I just assigned there for four years. After that, I was many places. And uh, I spent three years in Korea at different times. Um, I was in Germany for three years. I was in uh, Turkey. And I was deployed, obviously, to various places, too. One time we were up halfway between north part of or north uh, latitudes of uh, Alaska, not into the Bering Sea yet, but and uh, we were under the water. And we hit an iceberg un underneath, not an iceberg, I always call it an ice flow. It's a big chunk of ice that busted off an iceberg, you know, and it's been floating around looking for a submarine to run into. And it was, uh, it was hectic. I'm not kidding you. You hit, hit something when you're under the water, it's, uh, it gets your attention right away. I mean, it really rocked us because we were, we were going at a pretty good clip. On top of the boat, there was a launcher. And, uh, and of course, we had to be on the surface to launch. These were regular missiles. And, uh, and uh, we hit the iceberg busted a part of the launcher, so we were out of business. Uh, the, the first person that I remembered and thought of was uh, a, a gentleman that I met in Germany. His name was Adam. I don't remember his last name, but he was a Polish Jew, and he had been rescued from a concentration camp by the military police, the unit that I was assigned to in Germany. Now this obviously was towards the end of World War II, and he remained with that military police unit, even though he was part of what was called the Polish Labor Service. The U.S. government kind of formed up all of these dis displ displaced persons after the war to give them employment and a purpose because Adam had lost everyone in his family. And he most appreciated the American MPs for bringing him out of a very bad experience. I think uh, uh, the mil military service affects you in a lot of ways. One way, you are disciplined and you show respect for everybody and everything because you are a team and a team has to work together and it taught you to be on time and it taught if you were given a accountability or a job to do you got there on time or early and you got it done and done right and you always followed through and make sure it was done properly so in that aspect it really enhanced my life 
and I think most people in the military would probably say about, about the same thing. It's two years, but it was a good investment in my life. Well, it uh, was a stepping stone in, in my uh, career line, which was very valuable to me. And I got my first research paper from work in the uh, laboratory in the, in the Far East. Well, I continued to be a microbiologist, and when I was re released from active duty, I immediately went back to school to get my master's and subsequently my doctorate. I was 18 I, when I went in and I, was, uh, and I got out four years later. And I was married to my girlfriend. We had a baby a year old. The same girlfriend that I left and I was lucky enough that somebody didn't grab her while I was gone. And of course, the war was, was still on yet, but it, the combat was over. Yeah, all, the, all those poor soldiers and Marines and Army, and there was a, there was a bunch of them that got killed. Yeah. Uh, There's an old saying in the military. Freedom, for those who fight for it, has a flavor the protected will never know.